Welcome to Faith for Living. There's nothing greater than to have assurance of eternal life. That's what we're going to be studying today in Romans chapter 8 on Faith for Living. This is Faith for Living with Dr. Michael Milton, an outreach of Reformed Theological Seminary. Today, Dr. Milton brings the second half of the message, the sovereignty of God and the security of the believer. Here now is Dr. Michael Milton. We're in Romans 8, the mighty eighth. As we saw last time, there are people who could be compared to prisoners in Dachau in winter concentration camp prisoners who are spiritually malnourished. In this case, they're spiritually malnourished because they don't have the assurance of God. You see, this, this passage that we're going to be dealing with, Romans 28 through 30, follows the whole passage where the Apostle Paul is dealing with our sonship, our relationship to Almighty God as sons. And then what Paul is wanting to do is to is to seal that adoption with these doctrines. It's not just that He wants you to know that you're a son. He wants you to know that you're a son forever. And the reason that you're a son forever is that this is not about you. This was not accomplished by your decision. Yes, you made a decision. Yes, you made a choice. But what Paul is showing us is the mystery underneath that decision, underneath that choice, was the prompting and the moving of the Holy Spirit. It's of divine origin, not human origin. If it were of human origin, you could lose your salvation, and, and you would have no reason to believe that you could maintain the status of a son. Oh, many of you are trying to keep up the status of a son with, with trying to please God and trying to please others. But nothing can separate you from the love of God because God Himself, God Himself ordained that you would be His son or His daughter. So those of you who have resisted the doctrine of God's sovereignty, which we began to study last time, that God is absolutely sovereign. Romans 8.28, all things, even bad things, all things work together for the good, those who love God and to those who are called according to His purposes. And we're going to continue that. That was the first of four inseparable powerful truths that liberate us from the Dachau winter-like existence of a lack of assurance. So you can resist and fight against the doctrine and say, I don't understand it, therefore I'm not going to receive it, I'm not going to believe it, I'm not going to live like it's true, and you'll stay in prison. You'll still be a son and you'll still be a daughter. It's just you're not going to be happy. You're not going to have security and there's nothing more beautiful and warm and wonderful than living life knowing that nothing can nothing can stop you from being God's son and the Lord's daughter. Nothing. All things. Whatever bad thing you imagine even that thing will be transformed through the sovereign power of God into something that will work out for good. So nothing can separate you. Your past sins, your present sins, sins that you may commit, they're all covered by the blood of Jesus Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And your very position with God, what Paul is saying in Romans 8, 28 through 30, He's pulling back the divine curtains to show us these supernatural doctrines. These doctrines are being shown to you to seal your adoption, to seal your relationship. Now, the first one we looked at was, in fact, the doctrine of God's sovereignty. All things work together for the good. And we saw how 
all things can be good things and bad things, but God orchestrates them, providentially brings them together for the good of the believer. But the second great truth, the second great inseparable truth, and by inseparable I mean all of these are linked together. In fact, some of the, some of the former commentators call these the golden chains of salvation, these doctrines. These inseparable truths come together like mighty generals in the doctrinal army of God to release the imprisoned soul from captivity. And so sovereignty is the first one, and to yield to sovereignty is to yield to Almighty God and to know freedom, not to understand the depth of His mystery. Who can, who can understand that? Paul will deal with this in Romans 9. Who, who can... Who can plumb the unfathomable depths of the knowledge of God? But he's the, he's the potter and we're the clay. He made us. So the sovereignty of God is first. But here's the second. The doctrine of election. God's sovereign choice also brings about Security for the believer. Let's read again. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose. That's verse 28. And we've looked at that. Now verse 29. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So he links together the, the supernatural electing work of God before the first tick of the clock of time ever started. In eternity past, God chose you to be His. So one of the ways that we're liberated is knowing this. You say, well, that's a, that's a very difficult thing to understand. I, just when I was beginning to understand sovereignty by saying, I don't understand it. Now you introduce election. That's even harder. I know. But it's revealed. It is revealed that before the foundation of the world, Almighty God chose a number that is known only to Himself. But it's known to you, and it's known to others, when you repent and receive the Lord Jesus Christ you do what the Apostle Peter said. You make your calling and your election sure. You say, is this a unique doctrine in its place in Romans chapter 8? No. In the Old Testament, God had to remind Israel that uh, you didn't choose me, I chose you to be my people. You were a wandering people. And I made you a people, I made you a nation. I chose you. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul reminds the Ephesians that they were, were predestined. They were elected, predestined in love to be his own. Jesus created all kind of problems for himself when he began to say that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And the only, one, the only ones who will come are those whom the Father has called. And then he, he calls for men and women to repent. So mixed up in this In this doctrinal reality which is presented in the Bible is both 
the free agency of human beings and the divine election of Almighty God. And that's hard to get our human minds around because it is not of this world. If it were of this world, then it could not save you. If these truths were of this world, then they could not liberate you and free you. But in fact, the doctrine of election, like the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, is grounded in the, in the mind of God. And that's our hope. Our hope is in God. And the Bible is revealing His truth to give you salvation, but to also give you assurance so you don't remain a malnourished believer, but you're strengthened through the doctrines that He's given you. He's not given you election to confuse you. In fact, election is not intended for theological speculation. I'm not going to get into speculating about the doctrine of election. Do you have an E on your back or do you not? That's none of my business and none of any of our businesses. That's God's work, His divine work. All I know is whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You're elect. Make your calling and election sure. All God is doing, I say all He's doing, it's a glorious thing, but all He is doing through the Apostle Paul is pulling back the curtains of heaven and showing you the divine activity of Almighty God which is undergirding everything about your salvation and your assurance and your relationship to God. That's what this is. So, so don't approach election as if you have to intellectually figure out every detail of the doctrine. The doctrine is plain. God chose you in love before the foundation of the world. The same way that Jesus Christ was sent and God orchestrated events so that He died on a cross, He became the first of many others who would rise from the dead. So He would have many, many brothers. That's what the Bible says. In Christ, then, we have a model of that electing power of God. Now, Jesus Christ is God, has always been God. He wasn't elected to become uh, God, Jesus of Nazareth, wasn't elected in that way. But what God is showing is the supernatural, divine, sovereign power of bringing all things together and working them for the good. And in His working in the life of Jesus of Nazareth, we see the ruling motif of the way we are chosen. That's what God is saying. I once heard a little girl say at her daddy's funeral, the little girl was 40 or 45, she gave a word. She said, some of you may not know, but my Daddy chose me when I was born. He adopted me. My daddy looked at all of those little babies and he would tell me later that he set his eyes on that little red-headed girl and said, that is my child from all eternity. And so she was. There wasn't a dry eye in the sanctuary. As she went on to say that as she was growing up, she went through some phase where she decided to call her, her father uh, Jim. Not, not Daddy anymore, but you know, kids go through phases, and in this phase she had gone through, other people were calling him Jim, so she'd call her Daddy Jim. 
he put up with it for a while and then he set her down. He said, honey, everybody in the world calls me Jim. But there is only one person I have chosen to call me Daddy. And that's you. You see, she was chosen in love. He gave her a name. He gave her an identity. And he gave her a relationship. She didn't have to understand all of the intricacies, the supernatural intricacies of the electing choice of her father. All she knew, others called him Jim, she called him Dad. Because he chose her. God chose you if you have repented and trusted in him. You've made that calling, that election, sure, by turning to him. Others of you, you've done that, but you, you're not embracing the fullness of what Romans chapter 8, what God himself from on high is offering you. That is peace. And nourishment. And wholeness. The doctrine of election stands at the gate of Dachau. The gate of your life. And the door is flung wide open. And you can walk through and know that you can call God Father, because He chose you. That is the doctrine of election. We continue on. There's more. Sovereignty and election, yes. But there's also calling. And now we move from eternity past to where you live today. Because the Bible says that for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And listen to verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. There are all different kinds of calling in the Scripture. There is a general call that goes to all men and women to say there is a God and you know it. Maybe someone here, maybe someone today who is listening is denying what is right in front of you in the stars overhead or in the beauty of the child's cooing. You know there's a God. And there is a general call that goes out in the Bible for all men to return to God. That calling is a calling to turn to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. And then He called men and women and boys and girls to follow Him. And that, that call is being given to you today. Follow Jesus. Hear the call. But how will you respond? What power do you have within you? 
respond. You say, well, if you make it emotional enough and put just the right music, maybe I'll get in the mood and you can get a response from me. Maybe. But it just won't be a supernatural response. Like every other doctrine, like every other general who is leading these four inseparable powers or doctrines or truths which are leading the army of God to bring you assurance, this truth also, the truth of God's calling is altogether in God's court and not yours. Calling by its very nature is something from the outside that comes to you. In fact, it comes through the power of the Holy Spirit through you. Theologians call that an effectual calling. Effectual because it, it, it works. It does the trick, if you will. It literally causes you to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ. So your assurance is grounded not only in the fact of God being sovereign and working all things together to the good so He can place you at just the right place at just the right time. It's not only grounded in the eternal predestinating electing powers of God before eternity in the mystery of, of the very mind and the loving heart of God for you and for the nations of the world. The Bible says there's going to be a number that no man can count. There are going to be representatives of every tongue and tribe. Election guarantees the success of the mission of the church. But then we learn our very calling is of supernatural origin as well. So that means when the coach sat down and talked with you about Jesus Christ in the locker room that day. Or your parents sat down and explained the Word of the Lord to you. And you remember sitting on the lap of your mother reading the Bible stories and you remember your heart being pricked your conscience being stirred. And you recognize that you too were a sinner and your parents' faith became your faith, not because it was inherited, but because something happened supernaturally. You were called. However it happened in your past, in your life, it was God's work. And if it was God's work, then you were safe. And for some of you today to open the door and to go free, and to leave the captivity of, of a lack of assurance, the captivity of living a life of not knowing if you're a son or a daughter of God, even though you have, all, you have God's Word and promises, is a matter of walking through the door. And the door again is being flung wide open now by the doctrine of calling an effectual calling where God the Holy Spirit moves through you, works in you. You say, well, that makes me a, a robot. No. That would be fatalism. We're talking about free men and women, free moral agents, who nevertheless, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, are dead in trespasses and sins. And unless God intervened, you wouldn't be saved. Unless the mighty eighth intervene, unless the allied forces intervene, the Dachau prisoners would never go free. But they did. And God did. And He will. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, 
apply these truths, we pray, and liberate Your children to have full assurance of faith. Healthy, strengthened, and living as sons and daughters of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a passion that I have on my heart, and that passion is Reformed Theological Seminary. I believe it's a ministry of the Holy Spirit that has been raised up by God to prepare pastors and missionaries to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. We're going to learn more about that in this segment that we call Profiles in Ministry. My name is Mark Jones. I was born and raised in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I have a history of uh, uh, being around and raised in a reform family and it just so happened I went to visit an associate reform Presbyterian church where the pastor was a, uh, a recent graduate of uh, Reformed Theological Seminary and he thought it would be a good idea uh, for me to uh, consider uh, pursuing the ministry and Reformed Theological Seminary would be an excellent place for that preparation to begin. Uh, with my degree, I, I plan on ministering uh, uh, in a pastoral uh, capacity, uh, preferably in a challenging uh, area where the preaching of God's Word is, is not uh, going on. Well, RTS has uh, prepared me uh, for ministry uh, by giving me uh, foundational things that will carry me through uh, during the difficult times and uh, that's so essential. Uh, one of the great things about RTS is not just uh, the theological aspect of training but also the spiritual side of praying and seeking God's face for His help and that's been so essential and that's been a pleasant surprise for me here uh, the spiritual side of the, the seeking of God's Spirit. Uh, as one of the professors says all the time, the wind is blowing. And so that's been a, a great thing for me. If you'd like to know more about Dr. Milton and the ministry of Reformed Theological Seminary, visit our website at faithforliving.net. Well, Dr. Milton recently wrote a book called Songs in the Night focusing on how the gospel can transform our pain into praise. Today we're offering a free chapter taken from that book called Finding God in Spiritual Depression. Now if you'd like to receive your free booklet, call us right now and ask for offer three. Again, ask for offer number three. Well, thanks for joining us today and we hope you'll be with us again next week as Dr. Michael Milton teaches us how we can have faith for living.